Now, last class, we were talking about the different components of an ecosystem, and we were looking at habitat versus niche. And we said that niche is the job or the role that an organism has in an ecosystem. What does it provide? What it's supposed to be doing all day? What organism is it supposed to be eaten? Is it a food source for another organism? Does it provide housing and shelter for organisms in the ecosystem? And we talked about, according to the competitive exclusion theory, no two species can occupy the same niche for an extended period of time. One species will eventually drive the other one into extinction. Organisms that are trying to occupy that same niche, they have a competitive relationship. Now, one species is going to be better adapted and is going to be able to survive and reproduce better than the other species. And we looked at the example with the cane toads that were introduced in Australia. And we said some advantages or adaptations that the cane toad had, which would allow it to be selected for through natural selection over time, is they have a greater rate of reproduction. They are larger. That allows them to have a more diverse diet. Anything smaller than it that will fit into its mouth, it's going to attempt to eat it. The cane toad is also venomous, so therefore nothing in Australia is eating it. And what we're going to see over time is that many native populations of toads in Australia are going to go extinct. The cane toads have better adaptations. And another key is the cane toads have no predators. In that environment so they're going to drive the other ones to extinction and we see this happen often when a species is introduced into an ecosystem an introduced species is a species that wasn't originally there it's not native to that habitat it was brought in either on purpose or on accident by human activity and it can drive those native species to extinction now something else we're going to talk about is called resource partitioning Sometimes you're going to have to analyze a diagram or situation and tell me if two organisms are trying to occupy the, occupy the same niche or are they going to be able to live together in a habitat because of resource partitioning. So let's take a look at what happens if we see resource partitioning in a habitat. We know that for organisms to be occupying the same niche, they have to be eating the same organisms in the exact same area. When we take a look at this diagram that's showing you different birds that are living on the coastline, you can see even though they're all in the same habitat, so they're living in the same area, they are eating different organisms. They're eating differently. And because they're eating differently and they're not eating the exact same resources in that habitat, then we say that they are in different niches. So it's like they're dividing the resources in that area. So it's called resource partitioning, and it reduces competition. So we don't have a situation where one species is driving the other one to extinction simply because they're trying to exploit different resources. They're eating different organisms in that habitat. So they're all going to be able to live together in that habitat without driving the other species to extinction. So that's what we mean by resource partitioning. They're dividing up the resources in that habitat and the many species can exist in one area. Now we're going to focus on energy obtainment and flow through an ecosystem. Ecosystems, organisms always must have a constant supply of free energy. You always need a constant supply of energy. That's why you have to eat so much during the day because you need energy because it takes energy to build your molecules to maintain homeostasis. Mitosis takes energy and so does reproduction. So you need energy to build molecules and maintain homeostasis. And if you remember, homeostasis means a constant non-changing internal environment. If you have plenty of free energy, then you're going to be able to grow. So it results in growth. 
and reproduction. In the snorkel activity that you did, remember, if you did not get enough energy, then you weren't able to survive. Sometimes you got enough energy to survive, but you didn't have enough energy to reproduce. So it takes an excessive amount of energy to grow and to reproduce. Insufficient supply for energy, this is an easy one, equals death. If you take in less energy than what you expend to maintain homeostasis, then the organism is going to die. There's different ways that organisms can acquire free energy in ecosystems. We've already talked about autotroph. Remember, auto means self. So organisms that are autotroph, just on their own, by themselves, they're able to get energy from the sun and make their own organic molecules. They don't have to consume food. They can make their food. Now, of course, in science, we give everything two to three names to confuse you. So plants that are doing photosynthesis, I can either call them autotrophs or I can call them producers. They're able to produce their own organic molecules using energy from the sun. In the last unit, we talked about photosynthesis and respiration. And for this unit as well, you need to remember those equations. Plants are able to take in CO2 and water. They use energy from light to build whatever molecules they need. They're organic molecules. They can build glucose, they can build proteins and nucleic acids and fats because of photosynthesis. In addition, they're making a byproduct, that oxygen gas. Heterotrophs are organisms that must eat. They must consume organisms to get organic molecules. So we can call them heterotrophs or consumers. And there's different types of heterotrophs. We can classify them as either herbivores, carnivores, or omnivores, scavengers, or decomposers. But all these organisms have to eat or consume organic molecules that they turn into energy, ATP. You all know that herbivores are organisms that eat plants. Carnivores are the organisms that eat meat. Omnivores are the organisms that will eat both plants and animals, like bears and humans and pigs. They eat both plants and animals. Scavengers are organisms that eat animals that have already died. When you think of a scavenger, think of something that will dig through your trash, something that has teeth or a beak, um, and it'll, it's able to tear food, tear you know, dead, decomposing material. Some examples of scavengers would be things like skunks, raccoons, mice, vultures. So these are bigger organisms that have teeth or beak, and they are consuming dead material. Now, decomposers also will consume dead material, but they kind of do it differently. They don't have teeth and beaks that will tear up um, the tissue of the dead organisms. There's two different types of decomposers. We've got detritivores, so think of like earthworms and slugs and, and maggots and dung flies. And then you have another type of decomposer, the saprotrophs, and these are the microscopic organisms. Now, regardless of what kind of decomposer we have here, they're important because they take those tissues of the dead organisms and they break down those tissues back into basic elements, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen. And let's indicate some of those nutrients: carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus. All those are found in the molecules that make up cells. So when they break down those cells of those dead organisms, then they're putting these nutrients back into the ecosystem. So they help recycle these elements back into the ecosystem for other organisms to utilize. Now, one thing that I want you to know is that autotrophs are the only ones that do photosynthesis, but I need you to know respiration happens in both autotrophs and heterotrophs. We can put all to make this make sense. All organisms, even plants, are doing respiration. And respiration, all organisms are taking this energy in glucose or other organic molecules and converting it into a usable form of energy, which is ATP. In addition, they make CO2 and water. Now, on the next page, we're going to take a look at how to diagram a food chain and a food web. And I imagine you've done this before, but I want to emphasize the most common mistake that students make when they're diagramming a food chain or a food web. Students have a tendency to get the arrows backwards. 
You have to remember that the arrows show the movement of energy. When we think of a, a food chain, like you see up here, you need to remember that the insect's going to eat the plant. So the plant's energy goes into the insect. If the insect is eaten by the shrew, then the insect's energy is going into the shrew. And then finally, if the shrew is eaten by a hawk, then we see that energy go from the shrew into the hawk. So be careful about drawing your arrows when asked to do so on food chains or food webs. Ultimately, all energy comes from the sun. All energy for all organisms in the food chain come from the sun, but we usually don't show the sun on a food chain or on a food web. Now, this is where it can get a bit confusing, but if you just take your time and really think about what these, these vocab words mean, then you shouldn't have a problem with identifying the different levels of organisms in a food chain or in a food web. So we're going to practice here. I will give you an example of a food chain and then I'll say identify the first level or the primary consumer. If you think about what primary means, primary school was the very first school that you attended. So primary means first. So the first consumer, remember the consumers are the first, are, is an eater, they're eating other organisms. So the first eater would be that first level or that primary consumer. Then we have the second level or the secondary, you can call it either way, second level or secondary consumer. Third level or the fancy word for third level is tertiary, at least they both start with T, consumer. Now I can switch gears, instead of asking me for the primary consumer, then I could ask you for the first level or the primary carnivore. Second level or secondary carnivore third level carnivore or tertiary carnivore. Let's use this food chain up here to identify what would be like the secondary consumer and the primary carnivore and so on. Now you need to remember that when you're trying to identify these organisms that I'm asking for, you have to start on the left side and then progress that away. So if I said what is the primary consumer, what is the first eater, then we need to start here with the plants. Well, the plants aren't herbivores. They're not consuming. They're producers. So the very first eater or the first consumer would be the insect. And then we keep going. If the insect is the first level or primary consumer, then the shrew would be the second dairy or the second level consumer. And then the hawk would be that tertiary consumer or third level consumer. Now, if I ask you to identify the different carnivores, again, you're going to start on this end of that food web, and you're going to work to the right there. So if I said, what is the first level or the primary carnivore? A lot of students will look at that food chain, and they say the primary carnivore is a hawk, and you are incorrect. The plant is an autotroph. The insect is eating the plant, so it's an herbivore. So my first carnivore or the primary carnivore is the shrew, the hawk would actually be a secondary carnivore. So let's identify. The primary carnivore was the shrew. The secondary was the hawk. And this one's not showing you a tertiary or a third level carnivore. Now, when we're looking at food webs, we're actually looking at a diagram that shows many food chains interrelated. So a food web is just interrelated food chains. A food web more aptly shows you what we mean by interdependence. All organisms of an ecosystem are dependent on one another. So for example, if we change something about one organism in this ecosystem, it's going to have an effect on all other organisms in that ecosystem, even if they're not directly connected with an arrow. For example, it says, how would a badger be affected if a fungus killed many grasshoppers? And we see there's no direct arrow from the grasshopper to the badger, but the badger still could feel a, an effect due to the elimination of the grasshoppers. If there's less grasshoppers, then there could be less cardinals. That means that there's less food for the mountain lion. So the mountain lion is going to start preying more on snakes and the badgers because there's less cardinals for them to feed upon. So the badger could feel 
effects in that way. So again, even though there is no direct link between the badgers and the grasshoppers, the badgers could still feel an effect. Food webs also show the biodiversity in an ecosystem. Biodiversity just refers to the number of species in a habitat. The greater the biodiversity, the more complex the community, and the more stable the ecosystem. Remember, in populations, if we see variation, then the population is going to be more stable if there's a change in the environment. Not all organisms are going to be wiped out. We want to see the same thing in a community or in an ecosystem. We want to have greater variation, so a change in the environment is not going to lead to the total collapse of an ecosystem. If you think about it, the more species that are interacting usually means that each species has more than just one prey option. And if something happens to one of their prey, then it's okay. They have other organisms that they prey upon. Extinction of organisms, of species, is bad for ecosystems. It decreases the biodiversity and makes ecosystems more likely to collapse. Now, there are some species that could be argued are more um, important to an ecosystem. These species are called keystone species. And they're so important to the different parts of the ecosystem that if they go extinct, then we usually see an entire collapse of an ecosystem. One example of a keystone species would be elephants. There's so many different organisms that rely on elephants fulfilling their niches that the elimination of elephants would lead to an entire ecosystem collapse. Now, let me give you another example, maybe more relatable to you, about how we have a need for greater biodiversity which is going to lead to a more stable environment. Imagine if you go to lunch and there's only one food source being served, liver. Well, if you do not like liver, you don't normally eat liver, then you're going to go hungry that day. But think about whenever you go to lunch, all the different food options available for you, and that creates a more stable situation. If they're serving liver for one of the entrees, there's going to be other food sources for you that you can eat instead of that one. So again, the greater the biodiversity usually offers more prey options for the organisms that live in that ecosystem. So if something happens to one, then they have another food source that they can fall back on, creating a more stable situation. Now that we've covered this, these pages of our note packet, then you should be able to work through this food web review worksheet. And this needs to be done by next class, where it's going to be handed in.